here. Um, first, I'd like to introduce our, our, our actually our guest host for this session. He is a Berkeley alumnus. He's a professor in our music production and engineering department at Berkeley, as well as the director um, of our Berkeley Online Master's program in music production. Um, he's also received the Distinguished Faculty Award at Berkeley, uh, which is an awesome, awesome achievement. Um, in addition to all of his professional work, he's, he's worked with incredible artists, Dave Matthews, Bang, Joe Satriani, Joe Baez, MC Hammer, DJ Quick, Les Claypools, and members of Metallica. Um, you might know him from his work with, I think I can get this, Enrique, Los Amigos Invisibles. Yes, I practiced. Um, where, pronunciation. Yes, yeah. thank you, sir. Um, you know, they, they won a Grammy uh, for um, for their album Commercial and the collaboration, the Latin Grammy and a Grammy nomination in 2018. Um, go and check out his work if you have the opportunity to attend any of his classes or clinics or master classes. Obviously, you're going to want to do that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Enrique Gonzalez Mueller. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm... I'm blushing and thank you. <laughs> so everybody, good morning, good afternoon, perhaps good evening. Thank you for being here. Ole Romo, thank you for taking the time to be here. And I just wanna jump in and turn the mic over to you because there's so much material that you and I have spoken about that I would love for you to share with everybody. But just to give and kick off a quick introduction, You've been, for four decades, you've been a drummer, a programmer, an engineer, a producer, a mixer, everything. You lived in a bunch of different countries working in different markets. Mm -hmm. You've worked with people like Lady Gaga, Elton John, <clears throat> Eurythmics, and you have had a long-standing collaboration relationship with producer, songwriter, Mutt Lang, which has made some phenomenal records with you. A la Muse, Maroon 5, Sh Shania Twain, Nickelback, et cetera, et cetera. And the list goes on and on and on and on. So to kick things off, the first thing I want to say is thank you. And then the second thing is, could you give us a little bit of an introduction of how did you start as, I'm a music lover, I'm a kid that loves to do music, I want to pursue this thing, how it actually came to pass. And one thing only that you and I have spoken about in the background is that these talks are great as opportunities, yes, to sh tell people what we've lived, but also give them kind of uh, concepts, if you will. So what characteristics did you find in yourself as I was a music kid that loved music in this way. This happened to me because of these characteristics and traits that I observed. Well, yeah, it's, I think, yeah, uh, one, one big thing that uh, changed everything for me was just an enormous stroke of luck. And, uh, you know, that's not really a characteristic per se. <laughs> I mean, just, uh, I was, um, you know, I grew up in Stockholm in Sweden. I, I, I toured and uh, or played pubs and clubs and um, I had the uh, great fortune of um, uh, meeting uh, an English couple, a British couple that lived in Stockholm. They returned back to England. Uh, he uh, was a bass player and he got a job with Eurythmics and he then recommended me for that so I just uh, you know that that was back in the you know mid eighties. I actually got a letter in the mail asking if I wanted to go on a world tour with Eurythmics. Oh wow! How uh, formal! And, uh, of course, yes. <laughs> so, uh, so I uh, and since then, you know, not, nothing's been the same. I uh, I left Stockholm. It was at eighty four. Uh, went to London, rehearsed for a week. Went to Australia, and uh, the first concert, the first gig there was with. Uh, Narara Festival. It was like sixty thousand people. It was us, Simple Minds, Pretenders, and uh, and Talking Heads. And uh, right away, just right away, yeah. From one thing to into another. the deep end. Yeah. And so, of course, yeah, I had my mind there, thoroughly blown. And uh, you know, yeah, I haven't quite recovered since. It's just been, uh, yeah. So then I, we toured, uh, <laughs> continued touring uh, for a good while. 
uh, and then went back to England and then me and the bass player, we actually got a deal with Virgin Records. So we sort of uh, did a little seizure or whatever the word is uh, for a while. And uh, that didn't really pan out. And then I got back in with David again. So, I mean, at this point uh, I was now working, trying to navigate this whole different landscape that I'd never seen before. And uh, mm -hmm. it was just completely and utterly unfamiliar, uh, learning the language, uh, trying to understand sort of culturally, you know, how people interact with each other, uh, um, uh, which was dramatically different too from, uh, you know, what I was used to. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, in the end, I think, yeah, I was just stubborn enough to, to stick, stick with it. And um, you say what, um, what uh, I say attribute mm -hmm. or shall we call it that um, makes it work. And back in that, that back at that time, you know, I think, I, I think the one thing, I mean, what successful people have in common is obviously drive and resilience. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, uh, you know, sorry, you said drive and, and resilience, resilience. Yes. Uh huh. Uh, I think those two things to me is what uh, is it's absolutely required to get anywhere in this kind of setting. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, I mean, the theme, the theme for this talk is uh, what does it take to be world class? What's the secret to success, basically? And, and um, there is, it, it sort of implies that there are these, uh, okay, if you do this and this and this, you know, then you'll be fine, you know, you should have these positive attributes, you should have these, you know, be a good guy, you should be this and then the other. Mm -hmm. But um, I think, you know, looking back on it, you know, I think it is the ability to deal with setbacks and the, the ability to take knocks and uh, uh, live around friction and uh, sort of, and still make your way through that really to me is uh, the, the one thing uh, that, uh, Without that, you know, it's, not, it's just, it just wouldn't have worked. And I and think Ole, almost, hmm? let me ask you something, and I, I don't mean to interrupt, but to put a finer point on this, because the ability to take knocks and be resilient yeah. with this, you coming up, did you already have a destination that you were, I'm taking knocks, but I'm going there, or is it just more? I'm figuring it out as I go and the knocks that I'm taking are not setting me back from just moving blankly forward. How much of a, I wanted to do this versus just taking in the survey of what's before you was going on early for you. I think like you say, blankly forward. That's blankly that's forward. Best. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, it's like, I didn't know where I was going. I had no idea. I didn't know like what, uh, what, what was I at the end of this road? You know, I didn't know. It, it, what kind of a road I was going down. What I know, I think, uh, to be brutally honest here, and uh, of course, which it should be, is that fear of failure, uh, you know, motivated maybe more than uh, other things mm -hmm. uh, to, to actually be there and sort of uh, struggle with these things. And uh, of course, you know, successes too, you know, but successes are easy. Anyone can deal with success. You know, that, I mean, that, that's, that's not a problem. Yeah. Uh, it's the, uh, you know, not to sort of fold from, a setback or not to uh, just get knocked off balance by sort of friction and difficulties and uh, whatever it may come. That is really, really the, the most important thing I feel. And, uh, you know, but then what drives you forward? Yes, uh, drive itself is, is, uh, is a difficult thing to define. And if, if I can just uh, uh, do a little digression here, this, uh, uh, a friend of mine who uh, is a CEO of a big company, where I was talking to her, uh, and during the discussion, it was a while ago, you know, but this stuck with me. She said that when they hire people, uh, they, uh, when you're a big company, you have to automate the hiring process to some. You can't just get to know each and every one. So yeah. uh, there are forms to fill out, and you know things. So you can sort of detect uh, all kinds of qualities, you know, and the position that you need to be filled by somebody with certain qualities. But she said that the one thing that you cannot detect this way is drive, whether the person has drive or not, because it's, it's like this elusive thing, you know, and I, I, yeah. I'm not sure. Ambition is one thing, you know, wanting to get there, you know, but drive is like something, something else. Um, and so, yeah, um, that was a little, <laughs> little detour. This but uh, that, yeah, to me then, uh, the drive sort of <laughs> was fueled by this, shall I say, sort of fear of failure. You know, I didn't want to fail. I just did not want to fail. 
And so, and this in a way only is interesting for me to hear from this side because what I was asking before about did you have a destination? For me, a destination, it could be an opposite propelling thing. I don't want to fail, but one has to have an idea of what failure looks like. So that yeah. one can kind of react against it, you know? No, that's true. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. To me, failure would have been then to have to move back to Sweden. Great. And this to me, and for everybody, you know, here with us today is that I find these concepts of can we define what failure is? And you see that you had it ready at hand. This is what failure means to me. So my driving force is opposite to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and that, that, that's what at the moment, you know, that, that would have felt like, uh, you know, I, I just, it didn't work out kind of thing. It would have felt like failure. So I, uh, yeah, I, and that made me seem resilient, you know, uh, maybe I wasn't too resilient, you know, but uh, I was, uh, it, it was a better option to take some knocks, you know, than to fail. You know, if you like. Yeah, and you also said the I word is stubborn. So resilience yeah, stubborn, and stubbornness, yeah. and I don't know if it if it applies to you, but when I, if I would to be asked the question, I would add also a little bit of lunacy that it's we're a yes. little bit crazy to do absolutely this stuff, right. Yeah, absolutely. In an sometimes in an obsessive way, sometimes, but all of these things because we that make music were not the common denominator. I mean, you listen to a kick drum going do 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 for forty five minutes, and you don't bat an eyelash. You do that for a person for twenty seconds, and they go. Ah! So, anyways, yeah. <laughs> um, well, it's switching gears a little bit to, or progressing from this is, you're telling us that your friend put your name out, you start doing things, you, you start working with bigger artists. Mm -hmm. What in these different camps, right? You working with your friend locally, you working with nationwide artists, you working with worldwide artists, mm -hmm. what kind of, differences do you observe in the different rungs, standards of professionalism with these artists? So when you work with big artists, you find that those companies, for lack of a better word, what is the thing that differentiates those in your work with the more local or smaller artists? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't think about that. I mean, you know, it's, how do I describe that? Because, uh, you know, going to uh, I mean, not all big international artists are sort of have this larger than life or I say like somebody like Elton, you know, he has this larger than life thing about him where he just does, and, you know, but then there are many other sort of well known artists, you know, who are quite sort of homely and uh, you know, uh, not uh, you wouldn't sort of perceive in, in such a way you know, on a one to one basis. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I mean, but in, on a professional level, obviously, it's a uh, sink or swim. It's, uh, uh, you know, you deliver or you're out. And, uh, you know, if mm -hmm. you mess up, you never hear from them again. So it's uh, in that sense, you know, it's, it's uh, obvious. And I mean, I'm stating something very obvious here. Everybody understands this. That, you know, it's, it's but very this find, Only if I can interrupt just for a selfish moment is this is the thing that I don't think is plainly obvious to people. To me, it is. To me, it is that you strike out and you might not get a second swing, yeah. you know, but for a lot of young artists that work more locally, there's that, well, you're the only engineer in town, so you're obviously going to get the work, but, you know, and, and immediately you have this reaction because you know that for us, it's not true. So anywho, I don't mean to interrupt, but I just want to underline with a highlighter that thing of sink or swim, you don't, you mess up, you might not get a second chance. So sorry to interrupt, but um, please continue. That's great. Yeah, no. uh, and, and there is that, yeah, you, you can sort of, it's like this metaphor of, a, you know, a door opens and all that, uh, and you have to walk through it, but you have to sort of <laughs> stay there. You have to hang on to it because an opportunity uh, presents itself. And, uh, you know, I think uh, I can see people who have had opportunities, you know, but either didn't recognize them or fail to uh, fail to hang on to them, so to speak. Right? Uh, and I mean, therein lies the thing too. And uh, you know, here I'm, I'm stating like really obvious things, you know. But uh, you have an opportunity, but then to actually sort of hang on to it. And there, in there, in uh, I mean, uh, 
uh, I, I have I've had a lot of luck. You know, I've had a few recommendations, doors opened, I met somebody by chance, blah blah blah. It's led to all kinds of things. But then from that, obviously, you had to deliver. You had to raise to the occasion. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I've said, you know, I've been asked, so can you do such and such? And I'm like, yeah, sure. You know, think to myself, I had no idea. But uh, you, uh, you just get into it and you figure it out. And, and this, though, to me, is a fascinating thing because on you just said a minute ago, you can't mess up. But kind of almost <laughs> in the same breath, you're saying, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I can do this for you. <laughs> I don't know how to do it, but yes, I can do this for you. And this, to me, just spells out kind of an attitude, an attitude yes. of yeah. I will figure this out, but I need to figure it out well and do it correctly. So there's this forward motion thing, yeah. this I will work through whatever feeling that I get from you that I think Definitely. is great. Definitely that, yeah. And I think in order to do it, you know, from in my case, you know, I'm, I, I can't for the life of me say that anything here is general, you know, I can just speak of this in my case. You know, in my younger days, you know, I was uh, I was maybe a little cocky, a little sort of, I wouldn't say arrogant, you know, but uh, self-assured in some way. And uh, maybe that was masking something, I don't know. But, uh, you know, the result of that, you know, looking back on it is that uh, in, se in sessions, in so many sessions, there's always like a slight element of, of the fear, uncertainty and doubt. You know, I mean, the uh, stockbrokers and the investors speak of FUD, F-U-D, you know, this acronym. Fear and certainty that I mean, you know, and and so then anyone who is around who seems safe or who seems like uh, confident or you know has a very calming influence on other people. And uh, in my case, you know, mm. maybe it was like a touch of arrogance that made me come off as you know confident, <laughs> you know, even though yeah. I wasn't. But it sort of worked in my case, and uh, you know, not forever, you know. But uh, I, I looking back, you know, there was some circumstances you know where i saw that that worked yeah and all you're, um, you're making me think too in we having to work so intimately with artists and people in the industry for hours on end on in tiny little rooms mm -hmm. the thing that you're saying to me is um it makes me think of we're all complex human beings and we all have fear we all have pride we all have love we all have all of these things, it's how you're, it's sounding to me like it's how you arrange them and kind of how you present this. Like for example, if you see super confident singers, maybe they perform so well because they're reacting against the fear of, I don't want to fail. I don't want to come off as something. So could be. Could be. this kind of arrangement of how complex we are yes but how do we prioritize and kind of put those together to face yeah community? i mean it's, it's always an interesting thing you know what what is it that motivates someone and uh, there can be a thousand things that motivates someone to sort of to sort of uh, push forward you know fear of failure uh, desire for you know some particular outcome uh, whatever else it might be you know it's like a <laughs> There's like psychology here, you know, that uh, is way beyond me. But, yeah. um, you know, we're, we're complex beings, you know, and uh, what pushes us forward, you know, it's like it's very different for each and every one. And uh, in just the same way as uh, what makes us bold or what makes us, um, what knocks us off center or what sort of puts us off balance uh, is also a number of different things. And that is, that really is something that, uh, uh, is required that you can deal with these things that sort of uh, maybe somebody else would be knocked off center, but uh, you actually can go through that. You know, you come out the other end and you're fine. You know, you, um, and this is, a, I mean, I, <clears throat> I meet young artists who are full of dreams and hopes and uh, desires, expectations and, and that. And of course, that's, uh, that can be quite frail. Uh, that thing it's uh, it's mm -hmm. uh, it won't take much you know for this uh, say young artist to um, get uh, knocked off balance because uh, so much hinges on this uh, fantasy or the dream of, of success but uh, you know I can say for that that you know the, the really successful artists I've, I've met they can just walk through brick walls you know, by sheer will they have such incredible drive 
and uh, motivation and uh, nothing stands and they make they make it happen mm -hmm. so uh, and and here's like another extreme then you know in in, in a way you know the the big big artists uh, you know that, that i've known you know, have all have that in common you know that uh, just a phenomenal drive and the determination yeah and uh, and uh, then uh, obviously a confidence in themselves you know which is just unshakable um, and uh, um, but that, and we all sort of ask uh, then sort of uh, you want to work as a producer or an engineer or you know session player or whatever you know it's uh, good to have a little bit of that <laughs> of I, some shape or form or another you know however it comes together to sort of form this thing then yes you know it's uh, it's very important. So if I can riff on this for a little bit. Um, one of the things that you and I do as music producers is go and collaborate with these people that have a ton of drive and sometimes very pinpointed, sometimes hard-headed, laser-focused objectives. Mm -hmm. How have you found you get to go in and kind of crack the shell so that you can then have those collaborative conversations with somebody that you know part of their DNA is to be hyper driven. How do you kind of get in there for both of you? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say that, that I sort of um, get inside any of that. You know, I just help um, facilitate. And uh, it, it, it's that's all it is. You know, you just help facilitate. Uh, if you work as a whichever capacity as a say, if you're other than an artist, if you're an engineer, producer, session player, you know, you're you're doing a service. It's a service gig. Mm -hmm. And so you help facilitate uh, either a vision that you sort of had developed together or you know, the artist's vision or, you know, however that is, you know, but it, it is, you're doing a service. Uh, and I think that's, that's an important thing to remember too, in, in um, <clears throat> unless you are the artist, you know, say like, you know, we're talking, you're, you want to be a producer here. Um, many producers I, I see, you know, they, they would like to see themselves as, you know, maybe uh, artists or something else too, you know, and they, they sort of live with um, <clears throat> an ego uh, and uh, that can get in the way, you know, we all have an ego, you know, mm -hmm. most, you know, otherwise nothing works, but uh, you know, you have to keep it in check, you know, you have to know, know yourself, know thyself, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, to understand though, you know, that what your part in this puzzle is, is crucially important uh, so that you don't, you know, if you're the engineer and you're engineering like a writing session and you start sort of trying to chip in and write lyrics, you know, I mean, that's just rubbish. You know, you got to just do your thing, you know, you just to know, and I mean, know your place, you know, but in a good sense, mm -hmm. you know, because it's all yeah. a puzzle. We all come together as a puzzle. And so, you know, if you are the engineer, then be the engineer. If you are the producer, be the producer. You know, if you are the artist, be the artist. And, uh, you know, how, and I mean, at the, uh, foundation so to speak you know then of course you know the, it's, it, the interaction is uh, far more complex than that um uh, but uh yeah I'm yeah drifting off here. <laughs> no this this makes total sense and these things that you're saying as i'm hearing them they sound as the words in english they sound simple enough but i find that to actually achieve the things that you're saying is is quite difficult because you know, you have to know your role and stick to it because you are an integral cog in the machine. That's easy to say. Yeah. But if we really think about it, you and I, either when we were starting or when we work with young artists, we've seen the difficulty even in defining what a producer is and what a producer does. Absolutely. So if you can't even define it and convey it to your collaborators so they know where the gig starts and stops, mm -hmm. the collaboration gets really, really messy, inefficient, dramatic, unnecessarily, blah, 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 blah. So you're dropping these jewels that are easy to say, but hard to really live and do. No, it can do, yeah, it can do. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but in, in the end, you know, if everybody just understands, you know, that they are supplying a service, and uh, you know, the only really <clears throat> person who has 
saying that is the artist or the band or you know but then the band you know they sort of answer to the label and uh, you know mm -hmm. the management and you know everybody answers to someone you know, <laughs> in some kind of way or fashion yeah and the producer sort of sits there in, in the crossfire between the artist and the label saying you know and try to sort of keep uh, everything sweet and running when moving forward and so i mean it's, it's a complex web really you know I'm, I'm trying to sort of depict these things as you know uh, you know like uh, <clears throat> sectionalizing it but it's not you know, it's, it's it's really rather complex yeah mm. well it kind of looking at the time and i wish we had until 8 p.m but we have until two so in in the i'd like to shift gears a little bit and you and i spoke about if people only knew all that it takes to bring what a natural human being does up to the standards of what an actual commercially competitive record needs to sound like so it can feel like a competitive commercially released record if people only knew and people do not. So I'd like to turn it over to you on, you had prepped for us a couple of sessions or maybe a couple of tracks that you wanted to play. And, and I'd love to maybe switch gears to, to listening a little bit and getting your take on what does it take to bring normal humans to record status? Okay, yeah. I mean, maybe I should speak a little about that first because obviously it sort of starts with uh, the recording of, you know, and there it can be, <clears throat> it's an interesting thing. I mean, I think recording a vocalist is, uh, and recording than the artist, you know, you know, which it is in many cases, is uh, you know the, to my mind, you know, the, the most interesting thing of it all. <laughs> uh, it's um, it varies so much from singer to singer on how uh, that person feels comfortable. Um, so say like uh, one artist I worked with in, in the nineties, uh, she uh, uh, started. Um, she got on the other side of the glass, you know, and it just completely came. It didn't work. Uh, and uh, she has just felt on the spot and she could not express the thing. So in the end, uh, we figured out a way where we sort of set up a workstation for her back in the corner in the line room. And there she sat and recorded her own vocal, you know, and uh, assembled it herself. And this way she could really express herself. Uh, mm. and another artist uh, will stand in front of the console with a handheld mic and sing and have the music blasting out the speakers and just get the buzz from the live thing. Mm -hmm. The third artist will sort of stand behind the glass and feel totally comfortable with that, you know, no, no problem at all. Uh, this one I'm working with, worked with recently who was very, very dependent on uh, the uh, headphones, uh, like how, just needed to hear it a very, very particular way. And in the end, we ended up so that she has her headphones and her own uh, Pro Tools set up on you know, a laptop next to her uh, with the feed from the with the track and two microphones, one microphone that goes to her own Pro Tools thing and she balances herself, EQs herself, puts the reverb on and that's what she hears. And there's another second mic, which is the one I'm actually recording, right? So, but it's just to have a comfortable, so this is something I arrived at you know, after quite a while. And then she had complete con she had complete control over how she heard herself, and you know some passage she needed to hear really really close up, and and she's a very very dynamic singer. Uh, it goes from super quiet to really really loud and back again. Mm -hmm. So that of course you know after the fact you know that, that that's a whole other set set of challenges. But uh, what I'm getting at here is that uh, you know in order to get a good performance, you have sometimes to be a little creative about how, to, how you set it up and what the uh, environment is, uh, you know, how you actually record it. And this then, of course, you know, is uh, the atmosphere that you create, uh, <clears throat> who is in the room and who's not, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, there are all the myriad of things, you know, because it is just a very sensitive thing. You know? I mean, some singers, you know, they just get up and they get in front of the mic and they just blast it out. You know, there's just not a care in the world. Others, it's a very, very delicate process. Uh, so. And you have to be sensitive to this, you know, because of obviously without a great performance, you know, you really don't have anything. Yeah. It's just, uh, it begins and ends there. So here, yeah, just even if uh, say, say you work with a, a, an inexperienced artist, mm -hmm. it's good then to experiment with various ways of doing it. You know, even if the artist, him or herself, cannot express that, you know, hey, I yeah. wanted to do it this way, you know, because haven't actually sort of experienced it yet. Uh, you know, there are various ways you can do it. 
And it's just, it's a good thing that to be creative with this and just try various things because you might find that there's some kind of unorthodox setup that will just get the best performance out of your singer. And, and Ole, tell, tell me if you feel that this is true for your process that to me, knowing that no two humans are alike hmm. and coaxing a great performance out of them is going to require creativity from us. One, it kind of infers that you, you the producer, one are in the role of quality control. Do you feel that way? Do you feel that, well, we can do with the artist with the laptop in the corner or blasting or whatever, but I'm the one that at the end of the day said recorded by, produced by, and I need to steer the ship as creative and as uniquely as it can be to achieve a certain level of quality. Would you say that that's accurate for you? Yeah, yeah, in a way, yeah. I mean, um, yeah, so, you know, when you produce, an artist, you know, you facilitate and uh, you're providing a service. And I wouldn't say that, you know, I'm sort of quality control, you know, but uh, you just want to coax the best thing out of this person as you possibly can, you know, the absolute best representation of where this artist is at at the moment, uh, as well as uh, some commercial vibe. You know, you, you do answer the answer to label to, and that, you know, the artist may want to recite Shakespeare or something, you know, that's not going to work. You know, it's like, you know, it has to be something that's actually. Uh, somebody will want to, you know, so mm -hmm. I mean, there are limits to, to this uh, of uh, uh, serving the artist. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, I, I sort of come back to this, you know, that, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, my name will be on there and, you know, but it is sort of less important, you know, in that it's just mm -hmm. going to be the best, you know, get the best thing out of this person as possible. And I mean, it doesn't end, it, it doesn't end there, you know, with the, uh, so it's, it, it, you have a performance and maybe uh, you have like five or six takes of a good performance and then you got to piece it together. You got to sort of uh, post-process it. Uh, you know, you may want to melodyne it. You may want to use autotune, you may, you know, depending yeah. what uh, genre, what kind you know, thing you're working with, you may sort of, uh, and then of course, what you put around, how you sort of build the track around this. So with this, Ole, how about if we listen to a little bit of music so that we can... Okay, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's been a little tricky to get <laughs> artists uh, to um, accept uh, or to allow. But uh, uh, Esther uh, has graciously uh, given me permission to play uh, Esther Wiesnerova to, uh, yeah, I think, I think she's here, uh, to play one of her tracks and it's uh, I just I want to with playing this I want to um, illustrate a couple of things it's um, uh, now we've been talking about uh, the singers and you know and I mean Esther is a top singer she is a really is a first-class musician uh, she has recorded this I was not part of recording it uh, well there she is <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, yeah, but she uh, she recorded this in Austria with her band recently, and uh, it's a project you know, project she's working on. It has not been released yet. And uh, yeah, I will, you know, I apologize in advance, Esther. I'm just going to play like two minutes of the song here. You know, I'm not going to play the whole thing because, uh, you know, it's it's uh, quite long, and it's uh, it's sort of a quite low key number. It's uh, jazz, and uh, with this, you know, I'm just going to play it, and then I just want to talk a little bit about. Uh, the layout of the session and a few aspects to uh, uh, that I think might be good for um, for beginner uh, music makers and uh, intermediates, you know, to sort of be aware of. So let me see now. I gotta share the screen and because uh, I, I want to. Uh, okay, and I hope. Uh, the yeah, session doesn't, uh, my computer doesn't protest now too wildly because it, it's been a little problematic today. So, uh, and yeah, that is there. Okay, so I'll play two minutes of this and then uh, I'm just going to go over a few things like uh, uh, gain structures and uh, some plugins I used and uh, etc. So you That day it rained, he said, let's try the turn On the wet floor I fell, he didn't seem concerned I 
our steps were confused and our t- oh, okay sorry guys that's my computer's been acting those up. few seconds were magical i want to hear more it sounded very cool and our tires were laughable okay now i'm having a computer problem here so i, I apologize guys it's uh Yeah, I'm sorry, there's something going on with my machine on the The rain fell like spit, my clothes were cold and wet but I didn't unzip no matter where he led. Okay. Well, Esther, I apologize. You sound fantastic. But uh, I'm just having some technical difficulty. I'll see if I can play a little further. No, more. no. I apologize. It's uh, a. <laughs> It's uh, a computer problem here, a glitch. Uh, no, so anyway, um, thank you, Esther, so <laughs> for, cool. for sharing thank this. Thank you. So, uh, so what, I, what I wanted to point out and, and talk about a little bit is the, um, uh, for the vocals, so here we have the vocal thing. And um, I, th I think some music makers, you know, I see the sessions come in and one thing that's really good to do is to do um, gain, uh, think about the gain structure of um, uh, the material. So that's what I'm doing here. So these are uh, clip gain. This is not the volume automation, it's clip gain. So here's like the volume is straight here. So the idea is then to, to have a reasonably even level uh, go into the uh, first uh, compressor uh, mm -hmm. so that you know if it's a very dynamic vocal, the quiet parts will hit the compressor very differently to the obviously to the loud ones, and the sound changes there. So, so this is a good thing to do to actually work with the clip gain and just even out the levels of, of it so that it sort of hits the compressors in a reasonably even way, and mm -hmm. the, the, the sound doesn't sort of uh, stay similar that way. Um, I organized a session here so that um, <clears throat> I'm trying to sort of emulate. Uh, if you had uh, the summing of uh, an uh, analog console, like a new console, so that uh, here are, I'm busing it all together. And uh, this is a kind of, a, it's a fairly small session. It's just vocal, harp, bass, percussion, and a sax. So it's not uh, you know, like uh, drums and guitars and stuff. So, uh, but it's still, uh, this, the same principle applies. So that here, the vocal goes into its bus. It has a new, an emulation of it, which is very good, is a Neve preamplifier, and it has similar characteristics as a Neve board preamp has. You know, it sort of does a similar thing to it, and uh, then a tape emulation after that. So that uh, drums have its own bus that it goes into, and also then with its effects, so that uh, there's no, you know, uh, see if I scroll down. So here. Or the drums. Well, if I can interrupt for two seconds before we move yeah. to the drums, you mentioned that this amplitude editing that you're doing, the clip game that you're doing for the vocals, is in service of the compressor getting a more uniform dynamic range. But yes. when when you apply the the mic pre, which you know the the mic pre-emulation and then the tape emulation, what are you looking for with those? Well, then that is a, that is just like a little bit of extra magic. Uh, it is um, when you run it through the console because it, it has non-linearities and you know, the, uh, this is a UID, uh, Universal Audio Plugin. Mm -hmm. They've got the great uh, lengths of, of uh, figuring out exactly how uh, the uh, audio is um, interfered with by the circuits, uh, uh, circuitry, and uh, emulating that in the same way. So it does, I mean, to my ears, you know, it sounds very, very similar to running it through a uh, console strip. So it's just to get a little bit of extra magic. Now, 
I, I feel a lot of the plugins, you know, are just you just get a little something, you know. You rarely want like one plugin that does some big change or it does some huge uh, whatever to it. It's like uh, you get the micro, you get a little something. Then with the tape emulation, you get a little something. Uh, like here on the track, the first compressor uh, is this Wise compressor. I'm I'm not affiliated with any brands or anything. I'm, I'm not sort of advertising, mm -hmm. but I really really love this thing here. It's just controls level, doesn't change the sound. Here's another Wise plugin. You said it does not change the sound. It does not. Uh, it does very little to changing the the character of the sound. It's okay. Just, really just uh, holds the level really, really well. Mm -hmm. uh, this uh, too, this uh, <laughs> super transparent EQ uh, uh, thing, uh, you know, it's very, it's quite expensive in terms of CPU, you know, it sort of taxes your computer, uh, but it's just phenomenal. Uh, it's actually, a, I have a hardware uh, unit of this too, and this is apparently like a, an exact replica of, you know, the, the exact same code uh, running this. And then, I want to show this one is um, this is actually and if anyone hasn't seen this you know this is uh, something that you just need for doing vocals it's a so there's a Finnish company that's come up and this does uh, you know you can see how it works dynamically no matter where he led, still my revealed my so it's it is a dynamic EQ, but it's intelligent. So it sort of senses itself. Where I say like a, a dynamic EQ, where you sort of separate out four bands and you sort of work with those four bands. This one just picks itself <laughs> bands and it evens out them frequencies uh, to. So I spent years uh, automating equalizers and trying to, trying to sort of get rid of masking frequencies, you know, that come and go, you know, that yeah. uh, you know, they're, they're not there sort of all the time. But this one actually does it uh, automatically for you. It's, it's just fantastic. Uh, so you put it on there and it just sits and uh, you know, the frequencies that stick out, just dox them a little bit here and there. You can, uh, obviously you can see there are a number of parameters. You, know, you can set it to be quite harsh. You can set it to be you know, pretty mild. But uh, I find that it just makes, uh, makes my job so much easier. And uh, it, it holds them uh, reasonably you know, it's like a, some sharp frequency that certainly comes or some boomy thing that comes, you know, you'll just sort of grab those and pull them down uh, for you. So uh, I love it. It's, it's just really great. And Ola, just to, not to interrupt, but to underline kind of a theme that I was saying before about, you're saying something about an automatic plugin, right? Just now, but you would not deploy this plugin if you didn't have a necessity for the thing that ultimately it, it wants to do, which to me underlines that you have an objective in mind. Oh, and of course, yeah. I mean, and I, this it is goes something yeah. that I find is something worth underlining and hence the, my interruption because it, I think there's a separation between people that buy that plugin and go to the preset because it's the preset and then people that go, I have a necessity, I need to achieve this. This is the best tool for it and I will help it help me. Gigantic difference, but the conversation doesn't really start if you hmm. don't already have this, I need it to, I need to achieve this thing. This is the best tool for it. 100%, yeah. Uh, obviously, I mean, everything, everything, everything you do to any sound starts out with listening to it and uh, thinking to yourself, you know, okay, what do I need to do here? And uh, listening to it in relation to other uh, things, you know, surrounding it too, uh, how it sits in relation to uh, other parts of. Yeah. And uh, masking frequencies are, I mean, when when you, you just you just sort of get a basic sound, and you know, you EQ, uh, so you get in the ballpark of, you know, and then you got to sort of uh, take care of these uh, masking frequencies because they start to interfere with each other. It's like, you know, they uh, suddenly when the vocal goes through and it's like a two, 300 Hertz kind of bump just on a few syllables, you know, and that sort of collides with the bass. And it's just, it's, it feels weird, you know, it's, it, it doesn't sound right. Mm -hmm. So those things then has to be dealt with, you know, in order for it to see for things to stay separate. You know, you, you don't just sort of, uh, I mean, to my mind anyway, don't just, uh, set an EQ and, and uh, I mean, that would be an ideal world, but uh, it's all very dynamic, you know, frequencies come and go, you know, I'm sort of stating the obvious here. Uh, and uh, then, then, you know, this is extremely helpful. There's a, actually, if I may go on there, there's another plugin too that does a similar thing, you know, which, um, 
uh, is called, uh, was it GoFoss? This is, um, it does a similar thing, this plugin. Uh, this, they say that it's um, artificial intelligence, it uh, processes uh, like 300 times per second, it analyzes the material and it will pull things dynamically mm. or add dynamically too. So it's, it's, it's sort of a similar thing. You know, this one, with this one, you can actually add uh, frequencies or add brightness, etc. you know, whereas the, uh, uh, the other one soothe, you know, it, um, it only pulls. Uh, out, you know, which is, I mean, which is super useful. And such an interesting thing that if we look at the intricacy of everything that you're doing, it's in the service of the thing feeling normal to people. Oh, yeah, it is. And we yeah. see how there's nothing normal about this stuff. I mean, I'm I'm having one kilohertz so that it just can sound like Esther is going, I'm singing to you beautifully, believe the words that I'm saying, but it's so much that goes into it. It's crazy. Yeah, and 100%, you know, and you want Esther to just sort of sit and uninterfered with, you know, so she, she is just clear, clear yeah. in the center of the picture and everything else goes on around her. Nothing really sort of encroaches on or sort of masks her or sort of stomps on, you know, anything she does or says, you know, she, that clarity is like this, uh, of course, so much work goes into this. Um, in this session here now, you know, there, there's just four, five musicians, They're very, very easy. You know, when you start to get into like uh, live drums, several guitars, bass, backing vocals, keyboards, you know, it's sort of, of course, exponentially more complicated, you know, but the same principle applies. Yeah. And, uh, so that everything sort of sits within its own thing and doesn't sort of uh, interfere with or you get kind of get build up of frequencies and whereas like one in isolation may sound okay now they in isolation sound, sound okay but they sort of overlap in certain frequencies and it builds up and together you know they make like a nasty thing right so, uh, so yeah <laughs> only one thing um because i am super fascinated by going down the rabbit hole of this but i'm also mindful of the realities oh, of yeah, yeah. Time. <laughs> right we sure. have about some 10 more minutes to go and we have okay. some great questions from people so but i would like to kind of what would you prefer to do i know you had one other thing you wanted to play for us or I, that's okay i you say um, i think i think i've said what i wanted to say you know the other one was just more of the same really to sort of uh, uh, emphasize you know but i, I think i've yeah, it was just this I want to say. Of course, you know, we can talk about uh, uh, recording and mixing until the cows come home, you know, of course. You know, but totally. I, just, I wanted it to be just like a small aspect of it. You know, the, uh, no, and thank you. And if I can have the, uh, the help of everybody, thank you. And thank you, Esther, for also letting us share this. So yeah, yeah, this was you. awesome. Um, moving on to some great questions that we got. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you one last thing and then turn it over to some great questions that we already got from, sure, from sure. the attendees that the first one is, I'd like to ask you about how does, how do you find you protect yourself mentally? Meaning this that we do is not for everyone. It's at times quite arduous. Mm -hmm. It's strenuous on the mind and, and on the body. So um, conceptually, what are things that you're kind of looking out for now as you try to parse out work, life, perhaps family? How, how do you approach this? Well, that's a tough question. I mean, I don't know. I mean, for the most part, you know, I just trundle on. You know, it's mm -hmm. uh, there's no uh, formula or sort of deep thought, you know, behind any of this. You know, I, I must say, in terms of just and protect myself, yeah. Hmm. Uh, or have you? that thing again, you know, of, of resilience. You know, it's like uh, you know, you're resilient. You don't need to protect yourself. You know, you shouldn't need to protect yourself. I, I feel. Uh, mm. If you need to protect yourself, you know, then it becomes like a, a conscious act and, uh, you know, you, you, you'll start to uh, interfere with, you know, how you are and who you are and how you act, you know, if you're sort of concentrating on protecting yourself, say, you know, I mean, I, I, I may be misunderstanding your, what, what, what your question was. Let me about. just quickly maybe put it in this way, is that have you ever found yourself in situations where 
maybe you finish a project and you go, it's done. And I'm all, and I have also incurred the loss of a relationship or my body has suffered in a way, or I needed six months to get, come out of the hole. And what have those things taught you so that you can do it better the next time? Yeah, I've definitely been there several times. Yeah, definitely. But uh, I think uh, the greatest mistake I did uh, for, you know, I think uh, when I'm thinking back was to dwell on it. And mm. uh, by dwelling on it, uh, I mean sort of feeling when you sort of churn over it, you know, you say, say you, you come out of something, and you feel like you've been shortchanged or mistreated or, or not to uh, sort of got the bad end of the stick, you know, in some, some way, and you feel sort of bitter and uh, uh, your self-worth, you know, it hasn't been, or, you know, your, your worth, you know, has not been appreciated enough or along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, I mean, the thing that happens, you know, when I've done that, you know, it's just that I hurt myself you know, more mm -hmm. than anything else, you know, because I sit there and I sort of uh, think about these things and go over it and uh, you know, I feel angry and resentful about it, you know, and it doesn't uh, do anyone any good and it just hurts me. And uh, so I've been there for sure. And uh, it's, um, it's uh, very, very um, unproductive and uh, uh, it, it just doesn't serve any purpose at all. Yeah. And uh, of course, you know, that it, you probably, I mean, I had to go through it maybe once or twice or even three times in a big way in order to fully realize, you know, that this is just doesn't serve any purpose whatsoever. And so, because it's going to happen, you know, I mean, I, I don't think uh, anyone who's uh, been around for, uh, for a while and has sort of uh, avoided any of this. And it is like, you know, like I started out talking about, you know, it's like how you deal with these things, how you deal with the setbacks, how you process the, the, those kinds of things, you know, and how you, how you let them, allow them to affect you. Uh -huh. uh, you know, the, uh, because, uh, you know, if you sort of stew over something or you sort of feel bitter or self or something, you know, then you totally allow it to affect you in a very, very negative way. And uh, you, it's not good. You know, it doesn't lead to anything. One of the things that I'm, I think that I'm hearing transpire through what you're saying is, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it feels like you're talking a little bit about understanding that at the end of the day, the most important person is oneself. And if we get ourselves to be in, in a good spot, then and by not dwelling on things, learning from them, et cetera, et cetera, then it kind of seeps to, to the rest of the people. And we have to take maybe one or two or three hits around them to understand this is the reason why it got to me. Am I kind of getting it backwards? Yeah, or? I, I, it could be. I mean, the thing is that, you know, things that knocks you sideways uh, may sort of come in all kinds of shapes and sizes and forms and colors too, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, because you uh, sort of think that, okay, you know, I understand this now, you know, then you know, get hit by something else. You know? I mean, this is turning into a very negative discussion, right? <laughs> it's like, you it's know, important one. I, I think. But, uh, but it is, it is the it really, really important stuff. You know, we can talk about, you know, the good stuff and the old Instagram sort of influencer like, and you know, the, you know, how you do it. But, you know, this is really um, where um, that sets people apart, you know, yeah. how, how you manage this, you know, and I'm, I'm not saying dealing with it, you know, but I'd rather say manage it because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, um, it will affect us all. It does affect us all, it does affect us all in various ways, you know, but, uh, the better and I, you get at managing it, you know, the better. That's such a great word, Ole, the, for me, management, because I find that, like you said a minute ago, we're all different human beings, we're all unique, and we all come, I find that sometimes, whether we choose it or not, we come kind of imprinted with a certain nature. Yeah. yeah, that we gravitate towards something that sometimes doesn't put us in a great place. So it's understanding it and managing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a super quick, there's a movie that I love called The Babadook. Mm -hmm. It's a horror movie. Okay. And it's about this woman dealing with the um, grievance of just basically through depression. And it's not about taking it away. It's about understanding what it is what gets her there and then like you're saying 
managing it. Yeah. You know, and it manifests, it's a horror movie. So it's about a monster that, that manifests that. Um, but anywho, is that just something in art that really underlines what you're saying about management of whatever it is that we kind of face mm -hmm. or we're kind of dealt with in a way, yeah. such, a, such a great thing. Awesome. Right. Yeah, and of course, we, we all come sort of uh, equipped in various ways and how easy it's going to be to manage and deal with. <laughs> yeah. Some find, it, some find it not difficult at all. You know, it's really sort of, it, it can be quite an effort. So, yeah. But um, I think, and um, I'm looking at the time too. I wish we had more. Maybe we have the time to do one or two questions and, and then wrap it up. But although we got some great questions from the attendees and one of, um, one that, kind of nods to something you said earlier is how do you balance your creative integrity with that of an artist? Does the artist always have the final say? What do you think? Uh, most times, yeah. Uh, you know, it goes back again to the, uh, to the uh, uh, you know, as a producing is a service gig. And for the most part, yes. You know, I mean, uh, some people will... Uh, struggle with that and uh, some producers will sort of uh, battle and uh, want to have their way and uh, it may be a work answer but you know if for the most part yes the artists but then you know it's, it's up it's up to the producer then to sort of come up with ideas that are so compelling and so great you know that the artist like oh okay you know <laughs> i mean that's mm. that is one way to sort of uh, you know that's how you should be able to deal with situation if you feel that the artist is going down some bad way you know and this is just this, this is just terrible well then you have to come up with some either idea or you know something or other you know that that just um, that is so that. compelling it's so, it's so, so compelling you know that yeah you, you just have to go the other way you can't just be like uh, you know say no you know that, that it's kind of a silly thing you know to just sort of be uh, stubborn and uh, try and stop things you know, you know that that's not creative that, that doesn't move mm. things forward you have to offer, offer alternatives uh, you, you know you have to come up with better ideas you know, uh, great so you can, yeah. and i think it might be obvious but i think it's worth saying and tell me if you agree that these better ideas are only better or are being able to judge the better if they maximize and amplify what the artist is initially trying to say, but you just amplify what they're trying to already do. Absolutely, yeah, of course. It has to be in line with, you know, who the artist is, you know, absolutely, yeah. Within that uh, framework, yeah, within what, you know, it can't just be any old thing, <laughs> you know. But, uh, and when I say a better idea, you know, I, I, I say like an idea that's better and also gets the artist excited, you know. And in that way, you know, because of that, then obviously it has to be within that uh, artist's sort of, you know, uh, range. You know. Excellent. So then it also infers that a conversation, some communication with the artist has to happen either explicitly or not, where you do lock objectives, where you do understand what is it that they're trying to say. Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Right. I mean, it's a part, it's, you know, in so many ways, it's a, it's a partnership, you know, you're sort of you're working together and, and yeah. it should be, you know, you should enter into this, like, I mean, you enter into a formal relationship. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it may be a relationship that then sort of goes on, you know, or it may be a relationship that's like, feels like a close friendship. And, you know, as soon as the record is over, you never meet again. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, it is, it, it is, uh, it's intense. Uh, it's, it's, the uh, when you work in a studio it's, it's a small confined space you go there every single day uh, the artist's hopes and dreams and everything is at you know they're at stake here uh, yeah. there, there's is so much at stake for the artist and, and most most of the time for the producer engineer too you know but mm -hmm. producer engineer typically goes on to the next artist and then the one after that whereas the artist is left holding the record yeah. And, uh, you know, say stand or fall then with that, you know, so, I mean, much is at stake. And, uh, of course, then uh, the, the atmosphere uh, very easily sort of becomes, um, yeah, maybe fearful uh, or, you know, everything is, what I'm getting is everything is like amplified. In yeah. this relationship, you know, it's like, uh, it's really joyous. It's <laughs> really difficult. It's like, and the fear, uncertainty and doubt, you know, creeps in. And I mean, 
everything there you know that you would find in a typical like friendship sort of uh, in day to day life in a pressure cooker you know, the times 10 yeah <laughs> and only one last one to wrap things up is somebody asked this wonderful question that I would love for you to answer selfishly even disconnected to music is what keeps you going what keeps you going creatively and just kind of in life what are the things that fuel you oh yeah that's easy it's the joy of discovery it's you discover something new you learn something new it's, it's so exciting and uh, I must say I started working uh, recently with um, quite a few younger artists and uh, producers and such and, and uh, it's so infectious. I kind of feel like I'm discovering, rediscovering something here uh, that, um, that I haven't sort of felt for a while. I mean, but it is that sort of joy of discovery, which is uh, just great. <laughs> really great. I love it. Very cool. And I think when you and I met initially, if I can confess to you, that was one of the things that I feel that when I left that first call, I felt this guy and I have a click for this curiosity of life and being able to kind of listen and see somebody else's experience and try to see how it gels with what you've worked so hard to so this ongoing curiosity of discovery is yeah, yeah. is it no that's it that's absolutely it yeah Again, yeah. There. yeah it really does. cool Great. well we could be talking here till the end of of the cows coming home and going out and coming back again. <laughs> but time is what it is so everybody can you please help me in saying thank you to Ole for being here with us all right well thank you so much thank you so much man. most definitely jason ray amanda if i could uh if you guys want to say just a few words in closing or if there's anything you'd like to share for maybe upcoming events or something like that well, once again, I, you know, um, Ola, thank you for making the time. This has been incredible um, to, to have the opportunity to just, you know, um, have you share your experiences with us. I know this is, um, we'd obviously love to have you again on campus. One of these days, we're going to figure this out. Okay. You know, Marek, Marek has been plotting and planning now for <laughs> a couple of years. We're going to, we're going to get this to happen, you know. Yeah. Um, we're actually back on campus now. We're going to be having our students on campus this fall. So hopefully as things cool out and everything is safe and travel happens again, um, we might find that opportunity and uh, we'll get you a we'll get you a sweatshirt upgrade, sir. Um, okay. I'm going to get you a, your contact details and get you a, an official Berkeley sweatshirt. So yeah, that, you know, right. Not this Boston <laughs> University thing that you've got going on there. Um, but um, Enrique, sir, thank you for you know, guiding this uh, discussion. And, um, and what I'd like to do is, you know, for everybody that's here, we invite you to join us. Um, this link that I'm dropping in is a listing of all the upcoming remote events that we have that Global Initiatives is delivering. We have one coming up on June 8th with um, Dr. Joe Bennett from our professional music department at Berkeley. It's going to be forensic musicology. So building on what we're talking about with Ole, who's creating music, and Enrique, who's creating music and producing music, what happens when you find yourself in a situation where a song sounds very similar to another song? Definitely. And this is Joe's area of expertise. He's somebody who actually um, gets brought to court uh, to help decipher these kinds of things. So it's a very interesting session we have coming up and um, you, as guests in this session, will actually have the opportunity to be judge and jury on uh, some actually really well-known high-profile cases. We're going to actually present these to you and talk about how we break down the music in this. Um, and we'll have other sessions coming up over the summer as well. Um, hopefully, we'll have Enrique back with us um, for, some, from, for some creative opportunities for engaging online. For now, please just stay safe. Um, stay healthy, please. And just keep, keep creating great music. All right. We'll see you soon. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Ollie. Thank you, Global Initiatives. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Cheers. <laughs>